border is an international fiction. I think that it's important to understand that borders are established by power. They're the peripheries of power. And in that sense, they are arbitrary. It is not necessarily a natural uh, environmental function. It's something that's man-made, and it's something that we must understand exists for a time and then ceases to exist and appears somewhere else. This part of the world that we're standing in, Southern California, was at one time Mexico. I take a trip west into the Jordan River Valley and find myself atop the heights of Mount Nebo from here, I can see the controversial lands of the West Bank, homeland of the Palestinians, occupied by Israel for the past 20 years. On a clear day, it said, I could see Jerusalem from here. Today, I look out on a light blue haze, and I remember an image from the Baqa Palestinian refugee camp outside of Amman. Orphan boys play a game which looks a lot like duck, duck, goose, but in this context, the game acts out their reality. An arbitrary tap on the head, and he has to get up from his place and run. When he finds a new place, there's no security. The threat of the next tap always remains. Uh, the town of Saban and Lifford and County Donegal, we have situated uh, just uh, to the right of the second bridge uh, the actual physical presence of the, the artificial border which separates the six occupied counties from the twix, 26 counties. That uh, checkpoint is manned by the Crown Forces, by members of the RUC, which is a uh, 
the locally recruited uh, police force, uh, which was set, set up by the, the British government. This membership was drawn almost exclusively from the unionist uh, community, the unionist com community being the section of the community who supports the British presence. It is also manned by UD mem personnel of the Ulster Defence Regiment, which again is a locally recruited regiment of the British Army, which again is drawn from the unionist community. The experience of, of the local nationalist community in Saban, uh, when uh, travelling from uh, here to Lifford, which is only a distance of approximately one half mile, uh, that being about a five minute uh, drive in the vehicle, is that depending uh, on the mood of the Crown forces at any given time, at the checkpoint which divides a uh, Straman from Lifford, uh, if an individual is uh, fortunate in that the RUC personnel, UDR personnel, uh, are uh, in the right frame of mind, one could uh, drive straight to Lifford and simply be waved on at the checkpoint. But on most occasions, members of the nationalist community uh, being identified by local RUC and UDR personnel as being nationalists uh, go through an experience uh, in which they are taken into what is called the search bay. The search bay is a large shed constructed of corrugated uh, steel. Now, during the course of the time that they are in the search bay, the ve their vehicle will be searched. Each individual person traveling in the vehicle will also be subjected to a body search. And on most occasions, they will be subjected to uh, actual verbal uh, and at times physical abuse, which means that a, a journey from Saban to Lifford, which uh, should uh, uh, be around the top of about 10 minutes, could take a, local, a member of the local national community uh, anything up to two hours to complete that journey because of uh, the detention and harassment they receive at the checkpoint. Despite the, har the harassment at the checkpoint, that, uh, if you ask most uh, nationalist people in Saban uh, what the, the psychological experience is when they travel from Saban to County Donegal, they will invariably tell you that once they reach Donegal, that they have a psychological sense of freedom, that the, 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 the tension seems to leave their, their body. They uh, no longer fear uh, the, the, the harassment, which is a, a very real, a, a, a very uh, ever-present fear while they are in Saban. So uh, psychologically, uh, had, uh, the situation uh, has uh, developed that people um, do b believe that they have entered another country once they have actually crossed the artificially created border. Nicaraguan products on the other side and try to bring them through and probably have them confiscated at the border and people plan on bringing a class action suit or challenging the right of the U.S. government to restrict products from Nicaragua and the economic boycott that they or embargo that they launched to try to squeeze all a little more blood out of a country that's trying to get it together. We'll be gathering on this road, getting our banners together. If anyone's going to be driving their car through without Nicaraguan goods, they can decorate their car to go through the customs station.
And the, in the schoolyard, we'll have a table set up where the, some of the Canadian people who are working with us on this will be selling the Nicaraguan goods to us for those who, who want to carry Nicaraguan goods to the customs station. Those of us who buy the goods from the Canadians will carry them to the customs station, tell the customs officials that we're carrying these goods into the U.S. with the intent to sell them once we get into the U.S. And we want to sell them in the U.S. because that's the clearest way to be challenging the embargo. The legal penalty for not turning over, for breaking the embargo is $50,000 and 10 years in jail or vice versa. It kind of doesn't matter. Um, it's unlikely that they will apply that to something like smuggling a yo-yo in, but it's important that you know that that's what the, the legal situation is. Spokespeople. I'm, I'm one behind. <laughs> I'd like to speak to all three of you. Okay. Right, go right ahead. Okay. I'd like to know what your business is here today. We are carrying Nicaraguan goods to bring into the United States. Some of us are carrying them for resale, some of them are carrying them for our own personal use. Okay. Well, then what I'll ask you to do is to go through the normal procedure here at the crossing. That's what, okay. we plan That's to what do. we're doing. What I'd like is all of you to get into this area. Customs and uh, INS are set up for, to go through the inspections. It's just like a normal routine. You're not getting Why don't process. we go through the normal customs? This, this is the normal, is the normal procedure. Normal yes. Why don't we go through the normal customs? There is customs? no walk pedestrian area at this station. The back is the walk area. Well, there are cars that are on the line, too. Pardon? It's pedestrians and cars coming through with us. All right. The cars will go through the normal procedure. They go through the carport. Pedestrians are going to go through the pedestrian area. Lawrence? Norwich. Norwich, Vermont. How long have you been Vermont. up to Canada, ma'am? Just uh, since this morning. Came up it? special for the uh, border action because I am so concerned about what we're doing. What do you have to declare? I have a little Nicaraguan knickknack that I've spent $5 for and I'd like to sell it to a friend in the States. I said, I'm bringing this coffee from Nicaragua into the States, and I'm going to keep it, and I'm going to sell it for a huge amount of money, make a profit off Nicaragua profit. And they said, well, we're not going to screw with that, so we broke the embargo. Anybody want to buy some coffee? You broke the embargo? We broke the embargo. What does that mean? What do you mean? Made in Nicaragua Import Company. I'm one of the officers of the company. We're selling shares. <laughs> you want to participate in capitalism there, young man? This poem, for me, is especially significant because of the, uh, the country where I'm from, which is Panama, which, in, as far as I know, is the only country in Central America, I think in the continent, with five borders, limiting to the south with the, uh, the Pacific Ocean, to the north with the Caribbean, to the west with Costa Rica, to the east with Colombia, and then it has another border going right down the middle with the United States, and uh, the fifth border, La Quinta Frontera, which, which makes this... Uh, all the more meaningful for me. In every border post, there's something insecure. Each one of them is longing for leaves and for flowers. They say the greatest punishment for a tree is to become a border post. The birds that pause to rest on border post can't figure out what kind of tree they've landed on. I suppose that at first it was people who invented borders and then borders started to invent people. It was borders who invented police, armies, and border guards. It was the borders who invented customs, men, passports, and other shit. Thank God. We have invisible threads and threadlets, born of the threads of blood from the nails in the palms of Christ. These threads struggle through, tearing apart the barbed wire, leading love to join love, and anguish to unite with anguish. And a tear which evaporated somewhere in Paraguay, will fall as a snowflake onto the frozen cheek of an Eskimo and a hulking New York skyscraper with bruises of neon mourning the forgotten smell of plowlands, dreams only of embracing a lonely Kremlin tower. I am a racist. I recognize only one race, the race of all races. How foreign is the word foreigner? 
I have four and a half billion liters and I dance my Russian, my death defying dance on the invisible threads that connect the hearts of people. This wild six-mile stretch of canons, canyons and mesas has been described as one square mile of hell. By the hundreds and thousands, aliens emerge from Tijuana's tenements in the late afternoon of every day to await darkness and an illegal rush into the United States. The mesas and canyons are alive with people, I, which I don't know, I, I get, this is the same no man's land he was referring to, which are now alive with people. Mostly men, but also a surprising number of women and children. They gather in throngs on U.S. soil that the pitifully outnumbered, overwhelmed Border Patrol must concede to them in the no man's land. When okay. photographers go in there escorted by the Border Patrol, they're asked sometimes to wear uh, bulletproof vests, and the Border Patrol goes in there with shotguns to make sure that the photographer gets the point that this is, you know, one square mile of hell. Uh, this, these are the dregs of the earth and the enemies of freedom that uh, Fike is talking about. Unlike the docile rural youths who crossed over from the South in years past, a majority of the illegals nowadays are street thugs from the urban slums of Mexico and other countries. Uh, one would think that the uh, crime rate in those other countries must be dropping drastically if uh, so many street thugs are leaving. There's some other photos there. I guess Paul can show us the other photos of this immense army that was poised to invade the country. The soccer field is uh, kind of a wonderful place. There's, uh, People selling tennis shoes, uh, tacos. You can buy a shot of tequila to brace you if it's a particularly cold night, or you got to turn that one sideways, um, or buy a sweater. Here's a young man who's obviously trading in his uh, shoes for a, a pair of tennis that are going to get him across the border a little bit better, a little bit quicker. But but this is the uh, the immense army poised to invade this country. It's interesting, this, this use of military terms, this, this use of, of military language, war, uh, a, a war zone, uh, an, an invading army. en el transporte del Pacífico o el tren a, a Tijuana. Onda Ranchera. De Tijuana por el cerro en la noche, por el cerro corriendo y, y cuidándome de la, de la migra, de las Border Patrol, muchos. Muchos bordes de patrol, un helicóptero anda arriba, unas, unas luces grandes, fuertes, así, en la noche pegan las luces grandes y, y se ven los hombres ahí, hey hombres, para México, y ahí el helicóptero ahí parado, el helicóptero ahí, corriendo, corriendo por el cerro hasta, hasta Chulavista, a pie, son como, como dos horas o tres horas, agarra uno el bus por la MEI, en la Broadway, en la noche uno duerme por ahí, en la mañana como a las, a las seis de la mañana despierta uno y ya agarra uno el bus hasta San Diego y de San Diego a La Joya y de La Joya a, a Del Mar y de Del Mar aquí a Solana. on 
Oh, just a minute ago, I was talking about how this new uh, law will, will um, enable the employers to exploit the workers more, you know, kind of looking at it into the future. This is already taking place. Um, employees are being fired and losing their seniority rights and, and are being rehired, paying, paid out of cash, working in closed shops. Um, they're losing their apartment buildings or their, or, or their rents are being, you know, raised. And um, there is a lot of fear, fear um, within the immigrant uh, community. Um, they, they think that if they go out in demonstrations, if, if they, if they uh, speak up to their employers or to their lawn, lawn owners, they're going to be turned in to the INS for being illegals. So then they, they accept the, you know, the wages, which they have been accepted for the longest, but now with you know, an increased um, level of exploitation and their living conditions are, are being reduced already, it's, it's kind of surprising that all of this has happened so quickly. I mean, the, 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 the act was signed into law late last year, and now just at the beginning of summer, you know, there have been thousands of, of, of firings. Um, for instance, in the government district, um, I don't think that there's that much of a shortage as they, as, as they want to lead us to believe. Um, the, the, the factories are still operating, and not only operating at full capacity, but they are transferring many of, of the work that was done into the, in, in the plant to the homes. You know, I'm paying them at, at at wages which are way below, you know, the minimum wages. For instance, um, you, we, we, we have workers who can work in the government district for $75 a week, sometimes even less than that. They work 12 hours a day um, for six, seven days a week, and they get a check, uh, not a check, but, you know, a cash, cash for $105, $110, which is, is, is absolutely amazing. Um, and then we see the other side of the coin is that um, those um, workers who have, who who will be benefited by the law, or who has already been benefited by the law, um, they think that if if they go out and, and support those workers who are not being benefited by the law, will 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 be blackballed or something, and then they will lose the right, you know, to to become um, legal aliens. Our legal residents of, of the United States. This is a situation that both the Mexican and the United States governments have tried to remedy for a long time where immigrant workers are smuggled across the Mexican border by headhunters employed by large farm interests. The headhunters recruit the workers, make arrangements to get them across the border, and be delivered to the corporation farmers. It's so much per head. For years, large farmers from the Gulf of Mexico to the Pacific Ocean have engaged in a program of hiring these illegal entrants, which are commonly known as wetbacks. For the grace of God, you or I might have no choice in the matter, like these people that are discriminated against. Frequently, nine or ten people live in the one-room shack where they cook, eat, and sleep. How about sanitation? There isn't any. But it doesn't make much difference. They're only human beings. Now, if they were tools or farm equipment, they would be housed in a nice, clean, waterproof shed, but they're just human, so consideration isn't necessary.
site in ten o'clock. A group of San Diego artists have used their special brand of art to make a statement that has sparked anger around the city. San Diego's first Super Bowl is less than two weeks away. This historic sporting event is a unique chance to showcase our community. San Diego spends millions of dollars promoting itself as America's finest city, but now it's sending a mixed message. That's why it was disturbing to see posters crop up on city buses proclaiming San Diego to be America's finest tourist plantation. It's directed at tourists and residents. The poster appears on 100 transit buses, so there'll be posters on the streets 24 hours a day. The transit company sold the space to the artists. The posters were paid for with federal grant money and were supposed to convey the message that San Diego exploits undocumented workers. Sure, there are illegal aliens working in San Diego's tourism industry, but how many? Well, it's not the kind of thing that anybody keeps statistics on. But the INS district director says he hasn't seen a big shift away from hiring illegals yet. For those who, who are hiring illegal aliens, and I can't say how large a number that would be, uh, certainly there are some, some employers who, uh, who continue to hire them. The poster suggests that San Diego uses a type of slave labor through undocumented aliens, while at the same time trying to deny their existence. That's the Border Patrol putting handcuffs on an illegal alien. 39 alive calls on San Diego Transit to remove the posters immediately before Super Bowl crowds appear. I'm Bill Fox, and we welcome your opinion. Send us your ideas. Write to editorials at this address. Well, thank you, Allison. In the midst of all this good news, watch television that it really has an obligation to be truthful on occasion as it is it's simply a, a, a distributor of false facts and uh, superficiality and we got to have some decent television because it is the people's medium You know, I have a son, Alex, who recently has been having some nightmares about bombs. I guess probably most four-year-olds have said this to their parents at one point or another. After he asked me about 85 questions about how do bombs work and all that, he says to me, but Dad, why, why do they drop bombs? Why, why don't people just talk? And of course, given my job and my background, I knew the answer, and I said, well, Alex, there's not enough public access channels yet. Here's the unabridged explanation of how Deep Dish TV gets to you. It starts with thousands of producers making programs within their communities nationwide. They send their shows to coordinating producers, each in a different region working on a different show. All the edited shows are sent to Deep Dish Central in New York, where we coordinate the network. We take it to an uplink, which sends it to a satellite, which sends its beam back down to this hemisphere in a pattern called a footprint. Cable systems receive the signal in a dish and send it out to their subscribers on a public access channel through the cable system to your house, to your TV, to your eyes. Deep Dish is a unique network because it isn't driven by profit or religion. We won't try to sell you anything. Public access is a vital component of our First Amendment rights. Stay tuned to Deep Dish and see Fearless TV.
what I'll try to do is, is set out and substantiate that in, in this discussion about uh, the media and social responsibility and truth. I thought it was important to say that because we're going to hear various differences uh, from this panel, which is good and healthy, and I hope that people will participate and struggle because I'm going to say something, already have said some things I'm sure that people disagree with, and I think that's fine. Um, so there should be discussion and struggle, and it should be beneficial uh, and wide open, so to speak. <clears throat> when we talk about the social responsibility of the media, I think that it's important to ask what media we are talking about. And in answering this question, we must be careful not to fall into the well-worn, cliche-written swamp of the dominant U.S. media. This position would have us believing that there's some kind of monolithic society with relations and responsibilities which bind us all equally and, which, and to which equal allegiance is due. Such is not the case. The fact is that within the current borders of the territorial United States of America, there are entire societies which support the existence of a dominant society. There are oppressor, there is an oppressor nation, and there are national entities whose very oppression provides for the general well-being of an oppressor nation. And in addition to this, the societies themselves, are which are the societies which are divided into oppressor and oppressor and oppressed nations are themselves riven by the contradictory interest of class. The societies which are divided into oppressor and oppressed nations are themselves riven by the contradictory interest of class. When we view the social reality of the United States in this fashion, I believe the answer to the question concerning the social responsibility of the media has a far greater chance of being addressed without the falsification and obscurantism that's so common in the dominant U.S. media. Likewise, the question, does the media tell the truth? The fact that there are oppressed and oppressor nations within the United States, the fact that even within these social configurations themselves, that is the oppressed and the oppressor nations, there are contending class forces seeking to achieve their own separate material interests help us to understand that there is no one truth. There's the, there's the truth of the slave and there's the truth of the slave master. From time immemorial, the slave has disagreed with the truth of the slave master. Those of you without work permits, please come to the right line, sit down, and leave all identification material on the small desk at left. Telephone lines are a mighty important part of our town's communication system. I asked the boys if they knew what communication meant. Joe said he guessed it meant people talking to each other. That was right in a way, but communications is much more important than just talking. But I couldn't get tough with the boys. I knew they hadn't done it on purpose. I told them they'd have to be more careful next time, though. Telephone lines are a mighty important part of our town's communication system. Without communications, our town wouldn't get along well at all. Do you, uh, do you still uh, feel a sense of community? Do you, do you feel a, a part of the community still? Oh, yeah. We're familiar yeah. oh, and, and yes. friends enough with everybody in the neighborhood in the that neighborhood. if anybody needs help, we go run Yes, we don't have any problems. Bunch of nice kids. Yeah. Well, this is the League of Nations, actually, in our neighborhood. Yeah. Lady down the block is Spanish. She's married to a black man. We're Greeks. <laughs> uh, there's uh, blacks right next door. 
uh, I think they're from uh, Africa. Next time? Right. You know, Chef Brockett's cakes like this are made in a mold. So they probably all look pretty much the same. Yeah. It's not the way with people. People aren't made in a mold and baked and just set out like that. No. Everybody's different. Isn't it wonderful? You and I and everybody you see. And I like you exactly as you are. Yeah. There's a fatal epidemic spreading throughout the world, a disease called AIDS, a non-discriminate disease that can attack any person from any type of family. In 1986, Lyndon LaRouche's political empire created Proposition 64 on the California elections ballot. This proposition de designated AIDS as an infectious and contagious disease, making its victims subject to state quarantine and isolation laws. The proposition also applied to those carrying the AIDS virus but not suffering from the disease. Is it possible that we could actually do this to a family member or friend? Quarantine? Isolation laws? Imagine. I was in the hospital. Hell, I was in there for 10 days. They asked me a lot of questions. About how they think I contracted it. My social habits, what I knew about my partners. Stuff like that. I suppose my responses were enough reason for them to want to test me and my results came back positive. I think that fear alone could kill me. Kill me. Along with the fact that I've been exiled from my own society. I've been, been denied, denied my, my whole life. life. And do you think that there's any money for research out here? Ha. Huh. God, no. As far as they're concerned, the problem has been solved. I'm dead. I don't even have a fighting chance. Now that I think back about it, those doctors probably only wanted to know whether my test should come back positive. Or not. I don't know. Maybe public health had something to do with it. Maybe I really do have it. But I can't help but suspect that my social tendencies had something to do with it. I, I always worried, worried about, about those strange clicks on my phone. Sometimes I pray I could take back that moment. And sometimes I think about that affair and I say to myself, I was really living that. He, he made, made me pasta, pasta with homemade sauce, sauce and reread poems by Baudelaire. I never even considered who the people I slept with might have slept with. I really have no way of knowing. I, I was, was only, only being human. human. We must not, we cannot create a new form of concentration camps. Uh, land suit started in 1976. Uh, Mashpee was only 20% developed. And <clears throat> when the suit was filed, the biggest protesters were the land developers, uh, the real estate brokers, and the title insurance companies, uh, who were deathly afraid that their whole livelihood would be stopped in Mashpee if they weren't able to build and develop and sell insurance. And so, <clears throat> These were the people that, uh, that put up the primary fight. It was the town of Mashpee, which was now controlled by white town officials, uh, <clears throat> the New Seabury uh, Corporation, uh, other development corporations uh, uh, led the major fight against the Indians' land suit. When the case, uh, when the case was finally finished and Judge Skinner uh, made a decision against the Indians, and effectively in favor of the developers. Uh, the development began again after a short while. Once the banks and once the insurance companies had confidence that they were going to be upheld by the uh, federal courts, they began to build. And Mashpee now has been developed to the extent where instead of being 20% developed, it is 80% developed. Mashpee has changed from the once small Indian community to a white, middle-class, yuppie type of a community. 
it will never be the same. The words, we the people, signify the chain of unity, which now wells our vast empire of 48 separate states. You know, we used to watch the cowboy movies backwards. That way we'd always win. Oh, you want to talk to me about gentrification? People of color make up more than three quarters of the world. Let's address the I don't even know what Filipino is. I don't even know what the Torah is. Can we go with him? And she said to me, sure. We were told we could go the full range of Asia. So the first woman turns to me and says, Testing. Testing. Can you hear me? do with the native tongues that keep bursting out. What do you do with the native tongues that keep bursting out? What do you do with the native tongues that keep bursting out? Are that as prisoners of war, we represent the strategy that will liberate our people. And we have to do our utmost to disseminate uh, our message and to, 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 to do what is possible that the armed struggle grows in our country and that Puerto Rico sees its it's, it's final victory. We're living proof that there is an armed movement out there. We're living proof that Puerto Ricans are not submissive and docile and stupid and ignorant and dirty, okay? You know, we have challenged that. We're living proof of that. And we're not the first generation and we won't be the last. You know, and that's what it's all about. And that's why they strike out at us. You know, we look like we're harmless and they'll tell us, you girls look harmless, okay? But they know that we're committed to something that we'll give our lives to. There's very few Americans in this country that give their lives for this country, let alone uh, living in another country would they uh, give up, you know, uh, all the niceties of, of middle-class life. You know, and we, I've been to college, Lucy's been to college, they know we can all have, you know, these nice little jobs and a nice little house. We're human. I have a daughter that I haven't seen in six years. Lucy has a son that she was away from the whole time she was uh, in clandestinity. We feel we're mothers, we're human, but we feel that when you believe something, you should live your life as proof of what you believe. And if coming to prison means that we believe that our country should be independent, must be independent, and will be independent, we'll come to jail. Bye.
I'm so busy during the daytime that I don't have to be scared very much, but at night, when I'm trying to go to sleep, I just keep thinking about standing there and being sentenced to 20 years or something, and I feel, I feel really scared. I don't regret what I did, but, but the idea of being in prison for so long, I just, I'm worried that, um, that my friendships would change or something, that if I'm not there to be with the people I know and love, that, you know, they'll grow in different ways and I'll become something different and I would get out of prison and everything would, would have changed. And, and I want to have a child still. I'd really like to adopt one, most of all. But maybe it would be hard to adopt if I'd been in prison. And, and I also think that maybe if people are locked up for a long time, they get kind of closed in or less trusting, less warm. And so if I were locked up for a long time and I changed, then I wouldn't be as good a mother because I wouldn't be able to give out to my child as much. And that's something that I'm, I'm especially worried about. But we can't sit back and not get involved because it might not be safe or because it might not work. I um, hit the window and it all, the glass all fell out. And then I just reached inside and opened the door and walked in. And I, I was running through the halls and I had my crowbar in one hand and the drill in the other and I was looking, I was trying to find the, the computer because I thought I must have like three minutes or five minutes before they were there and I thought maybe they're already at the gate now. Mm -hmm. And I found the computer room and the computer was enormous. It was in five cabinets and each cabinet was like the size of a big wardrobe. And each cabinet was full of um, computer parts. It was full of boards full of chips on them and there were wires and there were disk drives. And So I took the crowbar and I started just hauling everything out onto the floor. And there were piles of computer equipment there. And so I just sort of danced up and down on top of them. And all these little plastic things fell apart. And, and yeah. still nobody came. And I kept thinking they're going to come stomping in here and yell, stop, or, or a shot will ring out, or something. And nothing came. And nothing happened. So I kept on working. And finally, I got there was one cabinet that I was having trouble getting into. And I remembered that you're never supposed to have drinks near a computer because that would be bad if you spilled them. So I was trying to think, where can I find some water for this computer? But then I saw that there were fire extinguishers on the wall. So I just took them off the wall and pulled the pin and squirted everything. And then I just flipped the switch and things kind of popped and sizzled and figured that was it. This computer is useless now. If I saw a toddler playing with a knife, I would take it away and the toddler would probably scream and pout and everything. You know, I'd hurt its feelings, but at least it might save it, you know. A toddler could slice himself up. And if I see um, a bunch of generals and defense contractors playing with an extremely dangerous first strike computer, I feel entitled to take it away from them and they're going to scream and pout and maybe lock me up for 20 years because I've hurt their feelings in their machine. But they didn't know what they were doing with it. There's no laws that should be broken casually, only in an extreme emergency. And I do, I am trusting, in fact, I'm putting my life in the hands of the legal system by saying that there's legal basis for what I did and what I did was right. And I trust our jury system. I trust democracy enough that I believe if I'm able to talk to the people, that they'll hear me and they'll support me. I mean, that's the point of democracy is that you have a dialogue. You have opposing points of view. If you don't have opposing points of view, you might as well live in a, in a totalitarian system. But we have differences of opinion, and we talk about it, and eventually we get to some kind of synthesis, some consensus, some agreement. And, you know, that's how a courtroom works, is I tell my side of the story, and the prosecutor tells hers, and the jury thinks about it, and they argue, and they, they decide. And I believe in that process. I believe in it enough that I'm risking 20 years of my life that the jury will hear what I had to say that will, they'll take me seriously and they'll, they'll take seriously my intentions and that I did what I did thoughtfully and carefully for good.
one of the companies that does business in South Africa is IBM, and without IBM, the efficient implementation of the pass laws would not be possible. The pass laws are essentially a system where blacks have to go around with a pass book which gives their name, their, the, the place of their birth, um, the, the members of their families, and other pertinent information. So this is the way that the government is e able to keep track of blacks under uh, the apartheid system. The enemy against which we fight is a vicious enemy. The enemy against which we fight is a powerful enemy. The enemy against which we fight is an organized enemy. But the enemy against which we fight is a doomed enemy because the system is an unjust system. Right from the beginning of the blockade, when we knew it was going to go on more than a day, um, we decided that we should have a very coordinated and, and very um, organized press office that would tell people what we were doing, why we had chosen this tactic, what we hoped to get from it, etc., etc. So, taking off from that, what we did when we got the computer upstairs and got our little typer and all our resources was get a press log of people to call and start calling them up and feeding them the story. Uh, and then we started typing out, uh, if you don't control the information, the information will control you. So we've been very aggressive, uh, although not in an intimidating way. But we've been, you know, we have written statements, and you read them out, and you're sure about what you're saying, and you're sure the steering committee knows. It takes a lot of communication. And uh, I mentioned earlier, we're not a bunch of students out here just running around through bullhorns. But inside, we're all running around, what exactly are we saying? But that's very important. Um, and then you get the people here. And when they're here, you're like, you know, can I help you? Can I give you a press packet? Uh, and you tell them the stuff. everything is because there are times when there are like just a few of us out there you know saying okay you know divest and it's just it's so incredible to just see I mean I don't know all the people who've been moved by this and the goodness that's come out in people in the past three weeks it's just it's just it's really the best damn thing, the best seen, thing yeah. I've ever seen here Another thing that's significant is the fact that it's happening here in the South Bronx. You know, the part of town where they say the only thing that goes on is crime, drug deals, and that kind of stuff, and where the people are too ground down to lift their heads up and to look at and care what's going on around the world. Well, here in this Bantu stand, we got people who are lifting their heads up, looking around the world and stretching their arms out in solidarity to the Bantu stands over in the other USA, the Union of South Africa. We brought you all here to this Bantu stand to send a message to the Bantu stands all over South Africa and to the world that we understand we share a common oppression, common struggle, and common dreams to end this madness. What we're doing today has got to be a beginning. Yeah, we are one family today, you know what I mean? Yeah. What we need? What we need, solidarity, 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 oh. Everybody wants the same thing today. Everybody wants a happy end. They want to see the game on Saturday. They want to be somebody's friend. Everybody want to work for a living. Yeah. 
Thank you. 